Thank you. Uh, is this the clicker? This is the clicker. Um, first, I just wanted to thank uh, Katrina and Dustin. Um, this is the, the, for the, the first year they've taken over. They've done an amazing job of organizing it. So just a hand for those two. <laughs> Really impressive. Um, so I, I feel sort of emotional about this. Um, I was here for the first uh, Open Hardware Summit, and I feel like I know so many of you, and I've learned so much from all of you. When I when I look out there, I see I see my mentors. Um, you know, the Arduino team, and and um, you know Nathan from SparkFun, and you know Phil and Limor from from Adafruit, and. Uh, it just goes, it goes on and on, and everything I've learned as, as I've built my own maker business, I've, I've learned because people were generous with their time and shared what they knew. And, and that is where we are right now. We are, we are fundamentally figure things out. We have really, we're groping our way in the dark, and there are no rules out there. Although, I, although I've got a kind of a, 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 a presentation title here that looks like I have the answers, I don't. All I have is experience, both my own experience and that of those who are generous enough to share it with me. Um, and if there's one lesson I'd like to sort of leave you with after my talk, it's that when we started off on this, we were very sort of idealistic and, and doctrinaire about what is open hardware and the license we talked a lot of. We went through the whole sort of, you know, typical open source license, you know, debates. And it was, it had a really sort of, you know, almost, almost a religious fervor to it. And as, as they say about, as they say in military, in the military terms, you know, no strategy survives the first enemy shot. Um, this is no time to be doctrinaire. It's no time to be dogmatic. Um, we are going to have to evolve our strategies as we grow. We now have a number of multi-million dollar businesses, um, open hardware businesses out there, and we're growing to the tens and the hundreds, and someday we'll create a billion dollar open hardware business. And I think it's somebody in this room who's going to do it. And the way we're going to do it is not, is by, is not by sticking to the plan that we came up with three years ago and being you know, completely rigid about it. We're going to do it by learning from the community and from the experience of all of us around us. So let me start by just giving you a little bit of my kind of um, bona fides on this. Um, I've done everything wrong, including uh, this is my first open hardware business. It was an autonomous blimp called uh, Blimpduino, an Arduino derivative. Let's just say don't put the six-year-old on quality assurance. That's first lesson. Um, uh, I, I don't think I actually paid the minimum wage. I don't know whether technically child labor can be your own children. Um, but customers are extremely um, unsympathetic when you explain to them that the missing parts were due to an infant having done the packing. Um, uh, then we, um, then I, with my partner, Jordi Munoz, we, we um, took our, our robotics business, our, our drone business, and we, and we started a proper, a proper company in a garage, as, as one does. And um, we just learned everything ourselves. We, 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 you know, Nathan was extremely helpful with, with, with Jordy, and we, we learned about inventory and about fulfillment and about pick and place machines and about reflow ovens and about ERP and, and accounting systems and e-commerce systems. And then, you know, eventually um, the Bible, um, you know, of our movement um, uh, moved to our industry. And, you know, and today, this is just one of our two factories. This is our one in San Diego. We have um, another one in Tijuana. Um, and we're really a big company now. Um, we, you know, we have two big pick and place lines, uh, and we, we're just a year and a half out of the garage. And all of this was learned, again, on, by doing it, by just trying things, by talking to our friends, and evolving over time. And what we've learned is that, is that the best way to make mistakes is by doing them and learning and, and listening very quickly to your, your customers. We are a community-based company. So we have DIY drones as our community. And the upside of being a community-based open hardware company is that you get these fantastic things. You get, you get the innovation. You get incredible feedback. You get customer support. You, know, you get um, great, great marketing. Um, the downside is that if, you're, if, the, if the front page of your site is also your tech support channel, when you get something wrong, your fires are on the front page of your site. And you have this incredible accountability to your community to get it right really fast. So every week, you know, if somebody's shipment didn't show up on time, or if a product was faulty, or if the tech support team doesn't get back to them in 48 hours, it's on the front page of our main marketing channel. And that, and that accountability is obviously a, 
complete pain in the ass when I wake up every morning and I've got to deal with fires, but it makes us stronger, it makes us accountable, and fundamentally, I think at, at, at the core, being community-driven is what open hardware is all about, and that will make us better, that'll make us innovate faster, that'll bring in more people, some of them will become contributors as well as just users, um, but it's not easy, and controversy is just, it's just part of the game. So let me just walk through um, some of the basic um, the, the, the business model. Um, business school professors ask us all the time, and I think this is true for all the open hardware companies out there, tell us about your business model. And we're like, you won't believe how boring it is. We sell products for more than they cost. <laughs> Do, should I repeat that? We sell products for more than they cost. Like a 17th century English you know, greengrocer understands the business model. Um, now that's the great thing about hardware is that there's, because there's physical products, there's a physical cost to making it, the notion of charging for it isn't, isn't radical. Um, and then just how much more should you charge, that's, that's, that gets more subtle, but fundamentally there's nothing novel about the business model. Um, we, we, we do something that we learned from a couple other people, um, uh, Eve Mount Scientist um, was one, Adafruit was another. They taught us the sort of the 2.6 multiplier, which is basically if you're in a business that wants to have both a wholesale, both a, but the direct to consumer business and a retail channel with distributors, you need to allow a margin for both. So basically, if you have 140% margin for you and 140% margin for your distributors, you end up with a multiple of 2.6 um, times the bill of materials cost. Um, now that should be the all-in bill of materials, including labor and all this kind of stuff. But but you know sometimes we're a little less, sometimes we're a little more. But that 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 2.6 number or 2.3 number, that range is pretty. Well, that was the most important lesson. We found that too many people underpriced their products because they hadn't really either incorporated their full-in costs, including returns, um, defects. Um, things like that, um, and they also hadn't built in margin for distributors. The nice thing about distributors is they're part of the community too. They end up doing customer support locally. Um, they end up um, uh, dealing with things like local regulatory um, issues. Um, they're marketing. And so I think understanding that, that leaving margin for distributors is part, of the, is part of the model is something that if you want to grow, you, you, you pick up from the very beginning. Um, you know, everyone, when we tell people that we're an open hardware company, you know, they usually say, well, but, you know, how do you protect your intellectual property? And you're like, we don't, you know, we, I mean, we, we license it so that anybody can use it. And as a matter of fact, they can use it under commercial term, commercially and they can compete with us. They can copy our designs and sell them back on and undercut us. And everyone's like, that's insane. You can't build a business. And the, and, 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 and the truth is, is that it's a challenge. Absolutely, and I'll get into this in a second. But fundamentally, our open hardware model allows us to innovate faster than a closed hardware model. And that speed of innovation and the community that both supports us and contributes to us is the barrier to entry. You can clone us, but you can't clone our community. You can clone us, but you can't innovate as quickly as our community can. And that, that is. It's better than patents. You know, that's, that's better than, we, you know, we do protect trademarks, but in terms of the underlying technology, we find that community beats cloning every time. Um, the, um, the general, we're, in a, we're um, uh, kind of a bottoms up approach to what is fundamentally a military industrial technology, which is drones. And we sort of said, well, the aerospace companies are taking manned aircraft and they're taking the pilot out of it, um, but it has a lot of those kind of manned aircraft costs and, and approval and regulatory issues. And we thought, well, we'll just come up. And so we built our original products on Arduino. And we did a grassroots, bottoms-up approach. Um, what, what, what that ended up doing is we did not have a better product than Boeing um, or Lockheed Martin. Um, but we had a much cheaper product. And ours was getting better faster. Um, and so ultimately, what we try to do is we try to, there's this dimension that, that, that you know, the traditional industries never think about or, or don't think about first. They often think about quality, they often think about performance, they think about a lot about marketing, think about, you know, locking up, you know, uh, customers, they think about sort of having regulatory, um, you know, excellence with big armies of law, uh, lawyers. But what they don't think about is, is seeing how cheap can you go, and especially in regulated industries. Um, we explored the cost dimension. We sort of said, we're not going to have the best autopilot in the world, but we'll have the cheapest. And we think our autopilot is going to get better faster. So we think 90% the performance for 10% the price is a good place to start. And then we ultimately, we hope to be 110% the performance for 10% the price or 1% the price because we think this model can innovate faster. We can close the gap more quickly. Um, finally, um, what we find is that when you lower the price, 
you don't just reach the same customer with a lower price, you reach a new set of customers. You know, fundamentally, the genius of the personal computer was not that it was a better computer than the mainframes, is that it was a more accessible computer. It reached a new class of users, and they figured out what computers were really for. They found the new use cases. You know, when you got that Apple II or the Mac in, your, and, you know, in, in the hands of regular people who had their own ideas and their own context and needs, they figured out you know, everything from originally the spreadsheets and, and, you know, word processors to fundamentally video games and then the internet and the web and all that. And so this notion that lower price is a new class of customers, it democratizes the technology and it creates the use cases, it finds the applications that the traditional business was not going to find. That's fundamentally what we're trying to do here. And so when we say it's the future of aerospace or the future of whatever industry, it's not that our products are going to be all that much better, it's that our users are going to be all that much better in finding new applications. And in a sense, you know, our job in, our, in my particular domain is to take this technology away from the middle, mil, military industrial complex and put it in the hands of regular people, and much as we did with computers, which were originally designed for Manhattan Project and you know, ICBM trajectories. The internet was designed for the military. And where they became powerful is when they were taken away from pure military use and put in the hands of everyone. Um, so everyone asks, how do you incentivize people to participate? And well, this is kind of where we've come down. And um, we have a big dev team, um, you know, m I guess more than 100 active developers, and uh, you know, on strict code and many more and other bits. And what we do is we sort of we had this hierarchy of reward. And what we've come up with is, is, is we're just kind of we're just rolling out the ability to do this. But when people submit some code and it's, and it's accepted, they get a T-shirt. Not a big deal, but it's people enjoy the recognition. Um, after they um, have a number of commits and they get a sustained contribution award, they get a coffee mug and a hardware discount. Again, these are sort of trivial things, but they're meaningful. And the hardware discount actually can, can add up to some, some money. Um, if they accept the role as a, as a project leader, which is a big responsibility, then they become a core dev team member and they get free hardware. Um, if, they, um, if, they, uh, if they become a, a team leader of one of the, what turns out to be a core product that ends up shipping, um, we, uh, we're now going to start um, these annual dev meetings. We just did our first one um, at the Spark Fund competition uh, last, uh, uh, earlier this year. And uh, we'll pay their way to the dev meeting. And then finally, and this is a little novel, and we're just now sort of playing it out. Um, if they led a, a, you know, a, a successful project to completion that becomes a core product, um, we're, we've structured our company so we can give them equity. Stock, we can give them stock grant um, in the company. Um, it's a little unorthodox. I think it was only been done, I'm not actually sure whether it's, I think it's been done by one other company in the past. Um, but we think this is, you know, who knows whether it's worth anything um, in the end. But we think that this is the kind of thing that, that sort of feels right uh, to us. Um, these people contributed so much to what we are and what we've become as a company. We want to incentivize them, but simply paying them cash doesn't move the needle. They all have day jobs. You know, by day they work for IBM or Apple or Google. Um, by night they work for us for free. And so we can't write them a check big enough to change their life. And furthermore, if we did write them a check, we'd have to raise the price of the product, which again defeats the original purpose of democratizing the innovation. So we think that, um, we think that equity um, uh, is an interesting way to go. Now, obviously, there's some tax issues, especially outside the United States. Um, and, and so you have to work with your lawyers about, you know, how do you, how do you give someone an equity grant and how do they pay taxes on it and, and all that kind of stuff. But I think this is an, an idea worth exploring. Um, obviously, the, you know, you know the, the, the uh, open hardware advantages, but the, the pace of innovation is really the big one. Um, for us, and the fact that the R&D is fundamentally free. It's not, it's not really free because we, we um, employ um, uh, liaison, uh, you know, software developers who work for us, but work with the team. Um, but but it, it, is, it is incredibly fast. And it, um, although it's not perfect, it gets better faster than the alternatives. It also gets us around a lot of interesting regulatory barriers. Um, uh, we, again, we happen to be in a highly regulated space, autopilots, but there's exemptions for public domain. Um, these things, by the way, are regulated as, as munitions. Um, there's export controlled, but there's exemptions for public domain. Um, in the FAA, which regulates the use of the aircraft, there's exemptions for recreational use, i.e. non-commercial use. Um, there, uh, you'll hear a talk later on tonight, uh, this, this, this afternoon about FCC, but when you're shipping you know, a, 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 a subcomponent, um, a kit, or a, something that needs work, you know, it may be exempted from some of the uh, FCC um, um, approval. Um, process. Um, again, Mike will give you details about just where that line is and where it isn't, but the, you know, there, is, there are some efforts there. And um, 
And, 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 you know, and fundamentally, it routes around regulatory barriers. Um, as I say, the business model is, it, because it's hardware, it's just, it's, it's head-slappingly obvious. Um, you can charge for it. Um, and the notion of product development done by customers is so, is so crucial because what this means is that if you, sh none of our products are perfect. But the great thing about shipping an imperfect product that's open is that your customer is not going to complain, well, they may complain, um, but, they're, but they're empowered to do something about it. They're, if, you, if they say, why doesn't have feature X? You know, you, please add feature X. You can say, well, okay, thank you. You can put that on the issues list. You can ask for it, and we'll get to it when we can, but you don't have to wait for us. You can do it yourself, and if you do it yourself for your own purposes, there's a process to integrate it so that everyone can participate. And what we find is that everyone's, everyone assumes that open source contributors are driven by generosity and altruism, but the reality is they're driven by enlightened self-interest. They want something. They want it, something to be better. They want a new feature. They, they're empowered to do it themselves. We structure it so they're incentivized to share it through version control or, or, you know, or into our code base. And once they do it and then, and then document it, then people start using it, and now they have a responsibility to the community to fix the bugs, enhance it, continue documenting it, et cetera. So it starts with an enlightened self-interest and ends up in a sense of responsibility to the community, which is a little bit of a burden, but is also incredibly rewarding because, because they, you, you get the feedback on a constant basis that people are using what you did. Um, one of this, you know, I think one of the issues we're hearing a lot about today is, is, um, is, is uh, the MakerBot situation and what we've learned from that. And I wanted to point out that, again, we're evolving our, our lessons. And one of the things I've, you know, it's been very interesting is that, is that there aren't that many, that many, you know, really powerful examples of hardware platforms that are open source turning into robust innovation ecosystems. Obviously, Arduino is, is one. Um, the fact they opened, that was open source hardware was absolutely fundamental to creating a, a, a vast number of derivatives of which we have many. Um, the RepRap was another. But when you look at what's, when we look in our own community, most of the derivative innovation is happening on the software side, not the hardware side. We release our hardware with the Eagle files, you know, in full compliance, but we actually don't see that many derivatives um, or improvements. Um, we see a lot of cloners. Um, but not that much, not that much, you know, um, a community participation in enhancing the product. Every now and then it happens, but not very often. And so what we're realizing is that there is a definite difference between hardware and software. Hardware is harder, and the fewer people have the skills to do it. And um, we find most of the power in open source hardware is actually from the software side that complements it. Uh, the fact that the hardware is, is, is documented makes it easier to write the software, but we're not, we're not seeing as much as we, as we did with the Arduino and the RepRaps of the world. And so this ask, allows us to ask questions about just, just how powerful is it to give everything away, or should there, in fact, be a line? Um, there was a, a good tweet the other day, um, Malik Ross, um, that I think is going to sort of structure a lot of the conversation over the, less, the rest of the day. And it's simply this. The principal political conflict of the 20th century was left versus right. In the 21st century, it's clo open versus closed. And this is, I mean, there is not a right answer to this, open versus closed. It is, every context is different, every market is different, every company is different, every community is different. And I think we need to be, we can't be dogmatic about this. We have to be flexible, and it has to be based on fundamentally what works. I don't give away, you know, I don't, we don't give away our, our, our software and our Eagle file because I am philosophically committed to it. I happen to be philosophically committed to it, but that's not the reason we do it. The reason we do it is because it works. We give away a little and we get back more in return. I think fundamentally that, that pragmatism, do what works, do what really adds value to the community. I think Nathan gave a speech last year where he spoke, Nathan from uh, Sparkfund, where he spoke about this. But fundamentally, if you're community-centric, if you're giving away the stuff that value, they value most, that they want, that they need, then that's the important obligation. Um, there's other things that you do that may not add a lot of value, but may in fact make it easier for you to build a sustainable business. And in those cases, I think you should be flexible about whether you want it to be open or closed, as long as you say what's valuable to the community first. So I'm going to list seven, seven things that we've learned about the limitations of open source hardware, and I'm going to say this as a huge open source hardware fan. We are, I was here from the beginning, I'm, I'm, I, you know, again, it works for us, we do it with almost all of our products, but we have learned that there are limits. So here's the first one. Um, the cloning is actually quite shocking. We could not believe how quickly we were, being, we were being cloned. And when I say clone, I'm not saying pirated exactly. And I, again, the terms of our license allow people to, to take a copy of it and, and use it commercially and sell against us. However, these ones go a little further. I mean, first of all, we do protect our trademarks. And, and typically, the, the cloners don't. 
Um, second of all, when they do a derivative design, and this is a derivative of one of our, of one of our um, uh, autopilot boards, it's actually, it uh, uh, changes nothing in any useful way. I just, they just seem to mess up the coloring scheme. Um, but they don't, they don't follow the terms of the license. They don't put their own Eagle files back in, back in the public domain. Um, they, um, uh, you know, they use our, mar they use our marketing material, um, you know, our, our kind of the text that we use, which kind of annoys me a little bit, but what annoys me more is that it's often not accurate. It often refers to a previous, you know, product, and so, and so that's just kind of upsetting. Um, and, and then finally, they don't participate, um, they don't participate when they're giving back to the community. I want to, I want to sort of, after I've said that, that was a very sweeping statement, I want to tell you a little story about a one time, uh, it, well, one of what may be several times when that wasn't the case. Um, not, all, not all cloners, quote unquote, are evil or bad or should be, or should be feared. And in one case, we had one uh, Chinese company that was doing a, a, uh, um, uh, a clone of our board, but then they went the extra step and they, and they translated the manual into Chinese. Um, the guy went by the name of Hazy. And um, I was really delighted about that because obviously, you know, we want to reach Chinese consumers, and the fact they translated manual was fantastic. Manual was fantastic, but they did it on their own site. And I asked, "Would you mind?" I just kind of got in touch with him, and I said, "Hi." I so noticed you copied the manual to translate the manual to Chinese. I think that's terrific. And he's like, "Hi, <laughs> you're not angry?" And I'm like, "No, no, it's great." However, would you mind? doing it on our wiki. Our wiki, is, we use Google Code, and the wiki is designed to have translations, and the advantage is that you can share the image files. If you share more of the underlying files, that way, as they change, it'll be more likely to be accurate and up-to-date. And he's like, sure. So I gave him um, edit permissions on the wiki, and in those days, and this was back in the subversion days, and I'm not proud of this, um, we actually had the same login for our wiki as we had for our um, version control system, our code repository. So the first thing he did is he translated, he, he, he ported the manual onto the Google Code Wiki, and that was great. He did a fantastic job and kept it up to date. And the next thing he did is he went into the code repository and he started translating the user interface on the desktop software, which makes perfect sense, right? That's exactly what you would expect. But I hadn't thought of that. And then the next thing he did is he started fixing bugs in the code. <laughs> And I, my jaw was on the floor. It was fantastic. He's now, he's now one of our best contributors. Our quote unquote pirate now works for us because we didn't treat him like an enemy. We invited him in and if you just reach out and invite them in, it's, you can find ways for them to add value to the community. If they're not participating in the community, it may be that they haven't been asked to. They don't know how to. They haven't, they haven't been, been given a way to participate. So I, so, that one worked great, and the, you know, the notion that today's cloner may be tomorrow's productive community member is something we should stay open-minded to. Um, however, that was one, and there are 99 uh, you know, others who didn't and won't give back. Um, and there is a concern that if the clones get out there and they're not as good, that fundamentally it's your reputation that suffers. So that's a limit. Um, two. Um, as we grow, as we open hardware companies go, we're increasingly getting interest from investors. And I can tell you, and, and you know, MakerBot has, has been through this and others have as well, investors fundamentally want to see intellectual property that can in some sense be protected. Um, you know, right now we haven't talked a lot about patents, but we will. Um, but they want to know, is there a barrier to entry? Now I believe our communities are, are, are a real barrier to entry. Um, you know, you can't clone our community. It's hard to build a community. But investors would like to see more, and, the, and you have to push back and negotiate, et cetera. But they, they do like to see a hybrid model. They want to see that something is unique and, and, and protected. Um, GitHub decided to, to open the stuff that was useful and protect some of their back-end um, software. Um, Sparkfun um, protects their, again, their back-end ERP um, software. And so I think this notion that as we get bigger, we're gonna start hearing these questions and we should have an answer to, you know, is there something that can be protected, is there something closed, is, is healthy and we should not fear that. Um, and a lot of them want to see um, the, um, uh, the open software closed hardware model, which may be where Raspberry Pi is right now. Um, we don't know. They're still evolving it. Um, but that's a kind of, that, that you're going to hear this more and more often. Open software, closed hardware. Um, we're not there at the moment, um, but I can start to see that maybe some of our products might fall into that category. And so maybe that's a betrayal of the faith. Maybe it's going to cause, cause me to be tarred and feathered. I don't know. 
Um, but I do know that the business pressures, as we grow, if we want to see that billion dollar open hardware company, we're probably going to have to see a hybrid model where, where some things, if not the hardware itself, then maybe some of the, some of the uh, software, you know, are closed. Or I'll get it in the last slide, some more nuanced version of a license. Um, finally, it's actually, not finally, the number three is that it's actually really hard to keep up with the terms of an open hardware commitment. Um, we rev our designs almost every week based on component supply, um, uh, you know, tweaks to our design, our um, feedback from our pick and place lines, et cetera. Um, we can't be revving our Eagle files every week and documenting the changes, et cetera. So basically, we only do unitary, we, we, do, uh, we, we, we post the unitary versions, uh, you know, like a 2.0, 3.0, and then sometimes we'll post the 2.5 and the 3.5, but in between, we don't actually post all the inter inter incremental versions because um, it's just too hard for us. Again, are we violating the ethos, the philosophy? I don't think so. Certainly people seem to be okay with it. But again, as you get into volume and getting bigger and doing more of it, it gets harder to keep up. Um, uh, number four, um, it's really interesting that as we, again, we move into more complete products that are you know, basically an out of the box, ready to go product, you start to move into things outside of software and electronics. Um, we have injection molded parts, extruded parts, CNC parts, we have cables, we have a lot of packaging, et cetera. Where, where, where do we stop? I mean, at the moment, we don't put out the SolidWorks um, designs of our injection molded parts. Not because, you know, not because we're particularly, you know, we thought much, hard, much about it. It's just that um, we didn't see a lot of value in it. Now, you know, first of all, we didn't want to translate it into another CAD program. Um, second of all, there didn't seem to be a lot of people who were asking for the injection molded CAD designs. Um, we did, however, put out some of our, uh, put out the um, other files for our laser cutting products because, laser cut products, because people knew what to do with that. So I think that as we get into more sophisticated sort of consumer grade products, you start to see more and more types of materials and manufacturing processes that don't lend themselves to the sort of, you know, ASCII and Eagle file, you know, file formats that we've been dealing with uh, so far. Um, Secondly, uh, sorry, uh, that was fifth now, or my, my counting's gone all off. Um, uh, we do find that when there's a lot of derivative designs out there, it does tend to commute, com confuse the marketplace. Um, and you end up with compatibility issues. Um, and we get this, and you know, we'll put out software that supports our products, our current hardware designs, and our previous hardware designs. But as more and more of the, clo of the uh, sorry, derivatives and clones are out there, the customers don't always understand the distinctions, and that becomes a tech support problem for us. Um, we also see older designs with flaws still, uh, still being sold out there um, as derivatives, et cetera. It's, you, you, hate to say, you can't get over your, your history in that respect because you can't control what other people will do with the designs, but it does complicate our job. Um, as I say, the product descriptions can be misleading, and the documentation is often absent. Uh, number six, um, I think we're definitely seeing a race to the bottom on pricing. And um, so right now, 2.6 seems to be a good number for us. We can still, we can still, um, uh, you know, we, it's, it's cheaper than commercial alternatives, closed source alternatives. But we're finding that um, uh, we do find some Chinese companies can get half of our pricing. Um, should we lower our pricing even further? What will that do to our sustainability as a business, et cetera? So again, we're feeling that, that effect. I think, as you know, I think 2.6 is going gonna, is gonna to hold, and as long as we continue innovating, we'll be able to kind of resist this, but you can start to see it wanted to go to 2.3, 1.9, et cetera. And then if it doesn't scale accordingly, you can start to see some issues uh, with pricing. Um, um, and, then, and then finally, we need version control we need better version control um, st uh, systems for non-code. Um, if fundamentally what we've learned about community is that if you don't have version control, if you don't have a, a platform for collaboration, collaboration doesn't happen. Um, we're, we're still looking for something that's great for as version control for Eagle files where you can see diffs, for CAD files, et cetera. They exist in proprietary solutions. A couple of companies are starting to play around with this, but what we really need is a GitHub for stuff. Uh, something that has all those social components, that's ways to sort of easily see what other people have done to reverse, to, to do derivatives, to branch, to bring the, bring the uh, to merge back in the changes. All that stuff that's so cool with software, we still need to make it, we still need to make it better um, for hardware. And um, I suspect someone in this audience will solve this problem over the next couple of years, but we're not there yet. Um, so finally, I just wanted to say, you know, as my, I am, I, I love the open hardware model, where we use it all the time. Um, but there are alternatives out there. Um, there are, and, and you, you know, I think over to, we will all have to ask ourselves, 
Should we consider these? Um, one of them is a conditional license, which is to say you have, people have to ask you for the files, and then you find out a little bit who they, about who they are and what they're going to do with it, and then you give it to them. It's not the standard open hardware model, but it does, in the right communities, accomplish many of the same things. Um, lots of people are putting up their schematics, not their full Eagle files. We put up our full Eagle files, but you see a lot of pressure to, to do otherwise. I think you have to ask the question, do the, do the schematics do enough to educate the consumers, the, the community, on how to use the hardware, or do you have to go the full way? Um, and finally, there's the notion of open, of open um, software, closed hardware, the Raspberry Pi uh, model. And I think you're going to see more and more people exploring this. And we're just going to have to deal with this as a community. Is that, is that part of our community? Is that a different community? Um, does it work as well? Um, but I don't think we should be dogmatic and, um, and, and consider that an impossible or, or, or um, unethical approach to open-based to, uh, to open innovation. So um, that's a really quick pass through what I've learned. And a huge thank you to all of you out there who have taught us this. Um, I want to see one of, these, one of you out there become the first billion dollar open hardware company. And I think we're going to do it by continuing to learn and evolve and not not stick to one, to one model, but instead recognize that bigger is different and that what got you here isn't necessarily going to get you there. Um, this is all, in, as I have to say, my, my publisher wouldn't be happy if I didn't mention that I've got a book on this coming out next week. Thank you very much for the opportunity.